Nice meeting you. Uh, some of you, I know I see a lot of familiar faces. Good seeing you as well, too. Um, uh, we have a day prepared for you where we will be discussing uh, many aspects of myeloma, you know, including some of the diagnostics, some updates on therapy. And as you've heard from, from Jenny, we want to make the most out of the day so you can, uh, uh, at the end of it, have additional information that makes you a more informed and a more empowered uh, a patient. So, so thank you also for, for being here. Um, like Jenny did, I want to thank the rest of the Health Street team as well, too, for, for all of what you've done to put this together. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Patel, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Costello as well, too, for you know, uh, uh, putting your time forward for this event as well, too, and traveling to be here with us. And uh, last but not least, two other heroes that I want to call out are sitting here on the, uh, to my right side. So, and many of you know them. So, uh, uh, Shireen Best, who is a nurse practitioner in our team, and uh, you know we all work together in myeloma related activities. And also Jaden, Jaden Pulino, you know, you know Jaden as well too. So, thank you for for coming as well too. During this first session, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of things. I'm gonna talk about the myeloma markers. And I'm gonna talk about MRD and what it means. And, uh, and again, just you know, write down your, your questions so, so we can uh, address as many of those as, as possible. Okay, so first of all, we have seen a huge improvement in outcomes and, and better outcomes and longer survival for myeloma patients. Uh, we won't be satisfied until we get to a point in the future where the treatment for myeloma is one pill one day that costs zero dollars and has no side effects, right? But until we get there, we're making a lot of approximations. So we keep improving. On the, old, on the left side, you see what I call the old survival. When I was in training uh, with my colleagues at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, uh, after the time of diagnosis, the median survival was two years. So you take 100 patients after two years, half of them would unfortunately have passed on because of their disease. On the right side, I, I cite to you three studies that have been recently published or presented that look at current survival statistics for myeloma patients. There's one that came out of Emory University where they said for patients who have no high-risk features about 13 years, patients with high-risk features about eight years. And, and I will point to you, uh, to you that in these three studies I'm telling you, they're not even getting the best that's available. So these are good treatments, very good treatments, but we can still up the ante with what you're seeing there. A study from the uh, organization of uh, uh, Dr. Patel from MD Anderson, uh, stem cell transplant and maintenance with, with rivalmid, lenalidomide, 111 months, they reported. And lastly, there was a Canadian study which looked at uh, patients who were treated, in that case, with was Cyborg-D. Some of you may have received Cyborg-D. It was a great regimen, it's still good, but it's now it's like a B minus as we compare it to other things, and they reported 159 months. So, so things are, are much better. <clears throat> I am convinced, and, and I, I would tell this to any of you if, if we were meeting for the first time, that we have the opportunity to actually cure some patients with newly diagnosed myeloma right now. It's going to take many years before we can look back and say that was the case. But our clinics are becoming uh, uh, enriched with people that are out 15, 20 years plus, and, you know, the, the myeloma still remains under good control or not detectable. So, so I'm very, very pleased with that. But again... Our goal is to get to that one-day treatment, right? So we're, we'll, we'll work towards that. Now, um, I already covered a little bit of, of this, but, you know, this is a slide I often use just to say that the, the treatment process usually is, is just putting together different blocks. And, and this would be like a, a block that I, you know, I would use for, for what we're seeing with the treatment for someone who would go through a stem cell transplant. So, you, you know, induction is a term, of course, we use for the very first uh, uh, treatment we have, then you can call it consolidation or we have transplant, you know, and this, that's something we, we offer to patients frequently. There may be a future where we don't do transplant, but right now uh, for patients, usually under the age of, you know, 70, 75, we will consider transplant as one of their options. Uh, most patients get maintenance now. Even if you don't get a transplant, most patients still get, get maintenance. And then I put uh, uh, an estimate of, of what I would say if you were only given one treatment at the time of myeloma relapse, if that were to happen, with very conservative numbers, one, one should uh, be looking at at least another, you know, three years. So not perfect. The best scenario would be you're not here today, but again, we're moving forward and, and there's, there's significant progress 
uh, with where we're going. Now, this is another way to look at this, and this, is, this study shows you a little bit of what's happening over time. We published this study back in 2017, so that's six years ago now. Um, I think many of you are familiar with this curves. If, if you're not, let me just explain it for a second. Uh, this curves, we call them Kaplan-Meier, and a perfect curve where nothing ever happens, it's a flat curve. So, so the, more, the flatter it is, the better. So as curves go up, that means there's improvement. In the bottom part, in what the x-axis, you see the survival in years, and then in the y-axis, in the vertical line, you see, of course, the probability. So again, the best curves are would be completely flat. What I, what I wanted to highlight with the studies, you see the three blue curves are patients with myeloma in, in um, databases that come out of the insurance companies. So we can actually cross-reference these databases uh, with the outcomes for these patients, and we separated uh, those three blue curves by the the year of the diagnosis for the person. So as you can see, it's much better if you're diagnosed more recently than if you're diagnosed way back in 2006 and 2007. And the reason is there's better treatments that always come and are available for, uh, for patients. Now keep in mind, we closed the study at 2012. That was the last year we allowed for the diagnosis. Just so we had some follow-up and we could report on what was happening on, on these patients. Um, so most of these patients have not seen carfilzomib, daratumumab, certainly none of them had seen, you know, like the CAR-Ts and things like that. So if we were to repeat the study again in 10 years, I bet you that blue curve will be even significantly higher than what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here. The second concept, and this is very, very important, um, uh, I know that the economists do something that's called the value of options. And that's partly what this slide reflects. And what I mean by that is, you're diagnosed at the time point, and, and hopefully, our, you know, part of the goal and the mission of us and Health Tree is that you're going to get the best treatment when you're diagnosed. You should be getting the best treatment. But if in the future there's another treatment that comes along and you did well because of that first treatment, you get the benefit of that first treatment, however much control that provided, but also there's a benefit that it opens up a new option because now you have a new treatment. A good example would be CAR T. So, if you go through the therapy and the therapy lasts, but then it turns out that at some point additional treatment is needed, but a hug is what? Now we have CAR-Ts, then you start linking those things. A great example of that is, uh, I'll, I'll use this, is when we started dealing with uh, the epidemic of AIDS and HIV. I was in fact in training when that was happening. About a third of all of our admissions to the hospital were AIDS-related complications. And there were no very, not very good treatments. And there were some patients who were getting, you know, some of those pills or, you know, just okay. But then what happened is some of them lived just enough so that they got to the next generation of pills. And some of them are still around here today. So someone who's diagnosed now with, with uh, HIV and AIDS uh, often can be close to normal life expectancy. And that's just because of this process of, of innovation. So that's, that's what, we, you know, we like to see as, as the research keeps, keeps going on. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go to my topic. So I'm going to talk to you about two things. One is explaining the protein markers, and the other one is going to be uh, the, the MRD. And, and, and by the way, if, if anyone wants the slides, I'm happy to share them as well, too, so you can, you can have those for, uh, for reference. Myeloma, it turns out, is the cancer that has the best biomarkers, as we call them, I'll explain this in a second, of any cancer. So that means we indirectly can measure what's happening with the, this cancer cells better than for any other cancer. And, and the reason for that is primarily because the myeloma cells, when they were normal before they became myeloma cells, they were plasma cells, produce the antibodies that protect our bodies. I think you'll know, we, you know, and with COVID now everyone knows this, we have antibodies that are part of our immunity that help us fight off infection. Now, through the course of our lives, uh, you know, our body produces thousands and thousands of different antibodies. In fact, if we look at the bone marrow, it can be somewhere between hundreds of thousands to sometimes millions of different antibodies. Each one of them is custom made to the bacteria or to the virus that it's, you know, uh, threatening us. And one of the ways that the, the, the body sort of has learned is that, okay, I already fought that virus, so I better keep a copy of that cell. I have a blueprint. So if in the future, again, that cell comes back, I already know what to do. I know how to produce that antibody. Now, those antibodies chemically are proteins, and that's why you hear the word proteins a lot. The antibodies chemically are proteins, and those antibodies are predominantly IgG and IgA. 
we have a little bit of IgM and you know some other antibodies that are less common, but most of our, our blood, the antibodies that we have is IgG. Now, if I was to take out all the IgGs from your blood and line them up against the wall, they would all be slightly different from the next. Because again, each one of them has been um, designed specifically for one given threat. So in, in, in the case of myeloma, one of those plasma cells, instead of just being quiet there in the bone marrow and kind of remaining, waiting there for the, for the turn to be cold again, just has a mind of its own and it starts making many copies. Kind of many selfies, I say, for that cell, right? So that cell grows. So now it turns out that we have all these thousands of antibodies, but then there's a lot of one. That's what we call a monoclonal protein. So that's what you see on the right there. So we can, you know, through blood testing, measure for protein abnormalities. Now, may, maybe some of you were uh, first diagnosed if you went to your primary doctor and they said, oh, the protein is high. There's something abnormal. First thing that should come into the mind of a doctor if the protein is high, could this be myeloma? Now, then you do other tests, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, an analogy I use for this, and I'm sorry for some of you who are probably going to hear this for the second time, is we use proteins in a way such as you could use a smoke to see if there's a fire. So just bear with me. You're walking down the street. You're walking past the building, and you see smoke coming out of a building. So the first thing you do is you make a diagnosis. There's a fire inside the building. And that's how we use these abnormal proteins. But then as the firefighters come along and you start seeing that, you know, they use the water in their trucks and the, the, the smoke goes down, then you know you're putting the fire under control. So the same happens with your monoclonal proteins. We want them to go down and ultimately we want everything to be normal, so no smoke. So you, and for some of you, perhaps with smoldering, you know that there's a little bit of smoke but it seems to be not too bad and that's how we use the proteins. And that's why they're so critical in how we measure uh, for myeloma activity. On the right side, so I show that the, the M protein base, uh, for many, many years we have used this in the clinical test. We, you know, we get results pretty quick. Now more recently, there's some improvements and we can go very deep. There's a word you might hear which is called the mass spec. And the mass spec allows us to go to very, very minute amounts of abnormal protein in your blood, uh, which we now actually do quite routinely here at Mayo for patients who have very, very deep responses. Now, the other way we monitor for myeloma is what you see there on the left side, which is uh, monitoring for uh, what's going on in the bone marrow directly. So this is going into that building. Okay, we know there's smoke on the right side, but now we're going to go into the building. And there we do everything like, you know, we stain the cells, we count those cells, so the percent plasma cells you have heard. We do the genetic markers for risk, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we also find the DNA fingerprint for those myeloma cells, so we can use that for tracking, and that's what we call the MRD testing. Now, I told you, you have the cells, right? You have hundreds of thousands of different cells in the bone marrow from exposure, you know, during early life that made you have that protection. How, do, how does the body make different antibodies? How, how can it make so many different types of antibodies? And the answer, and this is a little bit strange, is through mutation. So when our body faces an infection, the cells that will produce antibodies, they belong to a family we call B cells, they're just changing their DNA. They're cutting and pasting and nicking and this and that. They're changing. So you can imagine that's a pretty dangerous thing to do in, 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 in an organism. Perfectly healthy, beautiful babies have B cells that are mutating all the time just so they can produce the different antibodies. And our body is very, very unforgiving. If you make a mistake when you're mutating, that cell is, is, is no good. But if you do this millions and millions of times, every now and then one of the cells gets through the process. It's like a little typo that changes the whole history. And that's what gives rise to, to the process that we call multiple myeloma. So it's sort of an accident in nature. Well, it turns out with these mutations, actually, you leave, you leave tracks. You leave like a DNA fingerprint. And that's what we use to track when, when we do the, the test for MRD through the ColonoSeq. We, we're looking for that. So I'll tell you a, a few more words about that too as well. Now, with regards to the, and we're going to talk more about this, there's many, many genetic abnormalities. I know this can be a little bit overwhelming, and it's changing all the time. Um, it, it, you know, even within hematologists, we, we, we know we're always changing classifications. But just know that one of our interests is to see which type of genetic markers you might have. And as we will talk later, there's some that are high risk, meaning we're a little bit more concerned about them. They might be associated with, with more aggressive disease. We'll talk more about what that means and some that are a little bit uh, perhaps more sort of uh, more quiet or, or stubborn but not very aggressive myeloma. 
Some of them that we are targeting now, like some of you might know, there's an abnormal fusion that happens in this mutation process between chromosomes 11 and 14 that gives us a great target to use one of the medications, venetoclax. So, so that's part of, part of what we do. So let's just say a word of two about the proteins. This is a plasma cell. So if this plasma cell becomes abnormal, then this becomes a myeloma cell. And I put the word plump there just to show you how they look. It's like a fried egg, if you may. The white of the egg, we call it the cytoplasm. And this is a, a, a microscopic image. We call it electron microscopy. So you can see, actually, it looks like there's all the streets, right, in that white of the egg, the cytoplasm. All of those are folds that the cell has that are 100% dedicated to produce antibodies, proteins. So this is the classic myeloma proteins. And what they do is they, they produce them there, they fold them, and then they're pushed out. So they go into our bloodstream. That's the function of that cell. Of course, the myeloma cell is confused because now it's just producing proteins without the need for that production, but we can use that protein to track what's going on in, in, in the bone marrow for the, for the blood. Now, one of the, one of the things that we do is we actually uh, do a test that's called the protein electrophoresis. Uh, the test looks like the little strip you see at the top, that little blue, it's kind of a, a little bit of a smear, but what they do is they put a drop of the blood and then they run it in a gel that has, you know, it's under electricity, we call it electrophoresis, that's called the, the protein electrophoresis. And then you can actually spread out the proteins and you'll see a pattern like what you see there in pink. That is actually a normal pattern. That looks like a normal protein you know, composition in your, in your blood. So if, if someone doesn't have myeloma, it looks like this. It turns out that's a protein electrophoresis from my dad who recently got it done. I thought the image was pretty beautiful. So I asked him for permission to show that. <laughs> I said, dad, I know a little bit about this. So let me show that image. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, what you see on the right is what happens when someone has one of the abnormal proteins. It's called M-spike. M stands for monoclonal or myeloma. Now you see there's, a, there's like a steep upwards curve that goes there on the right side, right? So now we know this person has an M-spike, an abnormal protein, and then that should alert us all to the possibility of something like myeloma. Now, when you see that little spike, you just know it's abnormal, but you don't know what it is. So then our pathology friends will do things such as adding extra dyes. Now, in the bottom part, you see a G and an L. Those are dyes that are very specific. The G is anti-IgG, and that's positive. You see underneath the A is negative, and the M is negative. So we know this is an IgG protein now. And then at the bottom, you see a K and an L, and I know many of you will recognize this, kappa and lambda, and it's positive for the L. So now the pathologist would say, this is an IgG lambda protein, and then they can measure you know, how much is there in that protein. So that's how we use these proteins to, to, to track uh, the disease. Now, I've mentioned before, we do this thing with, that's called the mass spec. So the mass spec is a very, very sensitive way of looking at, at your blood. Our uh, pathologists in Rochester have done a lot of work in this, Dr. Murray in particular. Um, a way I explain it to, to my patients is, imagine the SPEP is like doing a chest x-ray. The mass spec is like doing a CAT scan on your blood. It's that precise. So now we can go to really minute concentrations of proteins. And, and we're learning how to use it, but we're very fortunate. We think this is a good tool to screen with greater sensitivity for activity of myeloma. There's many other things we, we can actually do from, from this test. Now, this is one I, I want to spend a couple of minutes explaining. It's a very important one. This is the free light chain. This creates a lot of, lot of confusion. That IgG molecule looks like what you see on the left side there. So you see there's two long strips. Those are called the heavy chains. And then there's two shorter ones, the ones that have the little red there. Those are called the light chains. And when, when plasma cells work and work normally, they produce about just the right amount. So there's a foursome that is, you know, uh, kind of well organized, like, like a good, you know, a uh, golf shop, right? It gets the foursomes right at the right amount. It's, they're all going out and, and, and doing well together. Now, under normal circumstances, our body produces just a tiny amount of extra light chains, very, very little. So if I were to draw blood on someone who doesn't have myeloma, I'm going to find a tiny amount of light chains. But sometimes patients who have myeloma, their cells will produce much more of that, and sometimes only that. Sometimes there's patients that may produce only light chains. Now, there's a test that was developed that is called the free light chain that measures in the laboratory only the light chains that are free. And if there's a, so if you look at your test results, it must say free. Sometimes people measure 
things that are called light chains, but it doesn't say free. So we'll measure the ones that are free, but the ones that are attached to the IgG as well too. So that's very important to keep in mind. Now, the way I used to explain it, what is a hot dog bun doing there, right? So the test was developed, imagine the IgG is like that hot bun, and when it's closed, you don't see the white. But people developed the test that would measure the white. So it only measures what's unbound to the IgG, and that's why that test is so important. This is a test we used to monitor, of course, that, you know, where the myeloma is. It's critically important to understand whether someone is at risk for kidney damage. These are the things that can create most commonly kidney damage in myeloma patients. And, and, and one that uh, really should be monitored in every patient. So it's very, very important that, that you know, this is done. This is part of our routine testing. Uh, so this is a free light chain. Now, a couple of other uh, sort of quick comments on the light chain. Number one is I tell my patients, and I would tell you as well to ignore the ratio. The ratio is more confusing than it's helpful. Uh, I know some of my colleagues are going to start throwing tomatoes at me saying that, but ignore the ratio. The reason is if you're kappa and then, uh, you know, you look at the ratio, your, your ratio can change dramatically by what happens to the lambda, and the lambda has nothing to do with the myeloma. So if the lambda goes up by 50%, then the ratio is going to go up, and it's going to go twofold, and then everyone's going to be alarmed. So once you make a diagnosis, I, I would say just focus on the absolute number, the absolute kappa or the absolute lambda. I know this is hard because a lot of publications talk about this ratio, but I tell, I tell the patients, let me look at the ratio, and you look at the absolute, because there's so many things that are abnormal. I promise you, if something comes back, we will let you know. But the ratio can be very, very confusing. The second one, this doesn't happen often, but it's important. For some reason, different institutions report this in different ways. Sometimes they report it per deciliter, and sometimes it's reported by liter. So you have to look at the units, because once, you know, in a while, we get someone who's really scared who tells me, oh, my kappa went from 6 to 60, it's exploding. It turns out it's the same concentration, it's just different units. So, so keep that in mind as you look at the units. Most commonly it's reported in liters. Uh, I, we reported it at in deciliters, so you just have to keep that in mind. So I, I hope this gives you an overview of, of, of what the protein markers are and why they're so important. And again, we measure them uh, in the blood and we can measure them in the urine. For the most part, I don't tend to do a lot of urines. I do one at the beginning just to know exactly if the kidneys are doing okay, if we're putting a lot of protein. But given the light chains, we can actually, for the most part, skip having to collect urines every time. In the old days, that was the only way we could test for light chains was by looking at the urine. But now with the blood test, it's, it's a lot simpler. Okay, in the, the few minutes I have left, I'm just going to talk to you about MRD and uh, minimal residual disease. And if you were in the parking lot, my, my car has a plate that says MRD neg. Because that's the aspiration we have. Unfortunately, everyone in the streets says, what is Mr. Deneg? It's like, oh, it's MRD Neg. <clears throat> but I'm the fellow there on the far left. When I was in training, back then, getting into a plateau was enough. Meaning, when we use melphalan and prednisone, if we have the concentration of monoclonal, monoclonal protein, we thought, that's good. Nowadays, we know that we want to do much better. So the modern version of that is getting to MRD. And, and I'll talk to all of you, and some of you may be MRD negative, some of you not, and then just what this means. I'll tell you that from my perspective, at the start line, the very first time we meet with someone, my goal is to put a plan of treatment so that we're in the best possibility of achieving this MRD negativity. Now, this is another way that we can look at progress. I show you those survival curves. Now, this, this is a bar graph. So the higher, the better here. That shows outcomes with the various treatments that are now being uh, tested for, for multiple myeloma, looking at uh, the possibility of creating MRD. So way in the, in, in the past, very few patients would get MRD. In fact, we didn't even have a test. It was pointless to do that test. But then as you see, as you progress towards the right, that's kind of the series of oldest new regimens. We went from an old time where maybe 5%, less than 5% of patients could get MRD. Then along came transplant and, you know, we say 20, maybe 30% of patients when we're optimistic. Now with the most recent clinical trials, and this is particularly clinical trials that now have added the monoclonal antibodies like daratumumab or isatoximab we can get MRD negativity in up to 80% of patients. Now, this is at the threshold of 10 to the minus 5. We have a way to go even higher. With, when we do the clonal seek, we do 10 to the minus 6, so that's even deeper. 
But even with the, with the study on the very last one, with the measure of 10 to the minus 6, it was 66% uh, of patients are MRD negative. So again, when we, when we start the game, we want to do everything we can to make someone MRD negative. You can't always do that, and it's not necessarily bad. But at the beginning, that's what we try to do. Let me go to this one. Now, this is um, what we call a meta-analysis. So this is a way by which you know, doctors get together information from many other studies and get it all together and do some studies. Like, I guess you know, similar to what you can do also with, with, uh, with Health Tree as well, that more information is gathered, so you get more accurate answers. And this looks at outcomes by MRD. And, and what they, they show, and, it, it, and this is the reason why you know, we push for that, is that if someone can become MRD negative, in general, outcomes are better. I'll say, and this, this is very important, it doesn't mean that if one does not become MRD negative, for sure things will be bad. No, it just means that there's a, a, a better chance of better outcomes if you're able to become MRD negative. Now, what I don't show you here, and, but other studies have shown, I think there's at least five studies now that show this, is that it does not matter when you get to be MRD negative. It could be before transplant, if you're going through transplant, it could be after transplant, or it could even be later after maintenance or consolidation. But as long as things are moving in the right direction, that's what matters. And that's why we track it so closely. I, I tell, you know, um, my colleagues that one of my favorite things to do in my clinical practice is that if I get the MRD results, I usually will get an email. And if it's Saturday night, I will call you home just with those results. Now, uh, you know, there's, we open that email and there's, you know, obviously trepidation. We want, we, I, I know this means a lot more, of course, always to the patient and to you and to your family. But we also get excited. We see that result. Yes, yes, that's good. That's a great result. So we want to make sure you know uh, about that when, when, when that happens. Because, you know, obviously that's, that's a, a very significant implication for how, how you're going to think about where you are with your, your treatment. Now, one of the things that is often misunderstood with MRD is... Um, and you'll hear about this in seminars or in conversations amongst us, you know, in, in the myeloma world. It's like, oh, is MRD ready for prime time? And can we make clinical decisions and this and that? I say, on a, from my perspective, MRD is clearly ready for prime time. It's just one more test. Just like I told you about the free light chains, that's how we should use MRD. Um, there's some people would say, well, we need to get clinical trials. And I tell them, we never had clinical trials for the free light chain. It's just a more informed clinical practice. So why do I put a dashboard there in the Supreme Court, you know, justices some, some years ago? I tell everyone, managing myeloma is like you're flying on a plane. You have to look at all of your dials. And it's, you know, getting all of that information together that lets you, what you, need, lets you know what you need to do. MRD should not be used like the Supreme Court, like the ultimate decision maker of everything that happens after you do an MRD test. So I have patients, for instance, who get treatment, and let's say they're two years in maintenance with Revlimid, and they become MRD negative. I'm not going to walk into the room and tell you it's sober. Forget about Revlimid. We're going to stop it, right? It's always a conversation. And some of them have told me, you know, I would feel an easy stopping therapy. Can we go for longer? And my answer would usually be yes, we can do that. Someone might say, you know, I'm really having a hard time. I can't concentrate. I'm having all this diarrhea and so forth. Knowing that I'm MRD negative, can we stop? And I would say, obviously, this is very good. This is good to know you're there and we can stop therapy. Every single clinical recommendation has to be personalized, has to be adapted to, you know, your preferences are what we know about the disease, what we know about this testing. So it's critically important that we don't think of MRD as the ultimate decision maker for everything, but it's just one more part, just like mass spec, just like free light chain, that informs our practice better. Now, um, this is how I think about MRD right now. So this, this, this square, I'll explain what it means. First of all, we're using it to measure the depth of response. And in my mind, as we develop new treatments, and you're hearing about the cetuximab and daratumumab, we want to choose those treatments that produce the greatest uh, rates of MRD. So that's the depth of the response. But what we're seeing too as well is MRD may be used to stop therapy. Our colleague, Dr. Krishnan from the City of Hope has said, one of the unmet needs in myeloma is the ability to stop therapy. And I think... Once you have patients that start becoming MRD negative, I think we'll be able to stop therapy altogether. And I say that, you know, historically our treatment of myeloma was like Pax Romana. You got to come in with overwhelming force and you stay there for a while. And we want to do that for those myeloma cells. But you'll see in this image, I put the boundary, an orange boundary there, 
uh, that uh, means that there are patients that can actually do very well without being MRD negative. I have patients that were transplanted more than 15 years ago who may have a small M spike and are still doing great. The only problem is that we don't know that from the get-go. We know that as we look back. But looking forward, it makes sense. But once you go through treatment, and, and I know there's some amongst you here that are still MRD positive, but you might be doing very well. One of my, my, my favorite patients that you know, has shown me this was uh, transplanted about 16 years ago, keeps an M spike of 0.2, so that's a lot more than just being MRD positive. No maintenance and continues to do well. So I hope this gives you just an overview. I think that's my last slide. I'll try to stick on time. Thank you again for, for coming. And uh, I always say in Arizona, everything is possible. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs>